Uh, my name is Paul Armstrong and I have the pleasure and honor of serving as the Vice President Academic at Mohawk College and I would like to welcome you to the Bay Area Climate Change Council Forum. Before we begin this evening, let's take a moment to recognize some of the first people who interacted with the environment in the area we'll be talking about this evening. We acknowledge that Mohawk College is situated on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek nations within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement and is currently home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are very proud to be hosting you here today in the Joyce Centre for Partnership and Innovation at Mohawk College for this very important event. This forum is supported by the Center for Climate Change Management in partnership with the cities of Hamilton and Burlington and the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. Now it's very appropriate that we're meeting in this building as it's the first building in Canada to receive a zero carbon building standard certification in both the design and performance categories from the Canada Green Building Council. We're very proud and we benefited tremendously from the leadership of many people, but Tony Capito being the lead on this building and Tony's here right over there somewhere. So Tony needs to take a lot of credit, but for driving us to push towards a goal that we didn't know whether we could achieve and we did. And it's the first in Canada, which is really amazing. And over that year, this building has created 15% more energy than it used and its carbon footprint is virtually invisible and it's home to the Center for Climate Change Management, which is the regional, a regional hub for collaboration on climate action. Here at Mohawk, the center brings together partners to collaborate and design climate change and sustainability solutions that improve our neighborhoods, businesses, and public institutions. Mohawk is happy to partner with the cities of Hamilton and Burlington to support the Bay Area Climate Change Council. I commend the commitment and work of the council members and the dedicated team at the Center for Climate Change Management. The fact that this is a sold out event, and you can see what a huge turnout, which is outstanding, is a testament to the importance of the issue of climate change, and it's also a testament to the leadership of the council and the scent that the center play in leading that discussion. This evening, we're going to be asking you for input. We're going to hear about the progress that the Bay Area Climate Change Council has made over the past year, and we're going to learn about the council's plans for 2020. We are also very excited and honored to hear from Dr. Mark Jackard, author of The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success. So to get the evening started, once again, welcome to Mohawk College. Welcome to the Joy Center for Partnership and Innovation. We hope you have a great evening. I am uh, John Paul Danko. I am the Hamilton City Councillor for Ward 8 on the West Central Mountain, which of course includes our host here, Mohawk College. As uh, the Deputy Mayor this month and on behalf of Mayor Fred Eisenberger, I'm here to say that Hamilton is very excited to participate in this, the first Bay Climate Change Council Forum. The City of Hamilton has been involved with the Bay Area Climate Change Office and Council since 2017. And Hamilton has continued our support through in-kind contributions and staff time, along with an annual $160,000 financial contribution. And of course, we look forward to continuing that support and working together to create significant reductions in carbon emissions in the coming years. This previous year was a big step forward towards real climate action. Hamilton City Council passed the declaration of a climate emergency in March of 2019 and worked to assemble a climate change task force to come up with concrete, detailed plans for greenhouse gas mitigation and climate change adaption are well underway at the city. The Bay Area Climate Change Council is a key pillar of Hamilton's climate efforts based on the following. Community. Member organizations were selected by community feedback and input during the initial engagement process in 2018. Equity. Membership reflects not just environmental organizations, but also business, institutional, and social organizations such as the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, Hamilton Health Sciences, and the United Way. And finally, urgency. 
with a vision that targets zero carbon in the Bay Area by 2050. The annual Bay Area Climate Change Council Forum, of which this is the first, is a key initiative where council, this council will report to you and you have a chance to report to them on your priorities and perspectives. It brings the Hamilton and Burlington communities within the Bay Area Climate Change Council structure and maintains that critical community representation and feedback. To close, we know that climate solutions must also be people solutions, and we need to make improvements in the way that our cities work. These people solutions, to me, uh, anyway, are the, the most exciting part of Hamilton's climate action plans. Speaking to Hamilton City staff, from our city manager, Jeanette Smith, to our public works staff, and all the way through every city department, staff are genuinely excited towards uh, working towards the goal of a net zero carbon economy by 2050. The sense that I get as a councillor is that council's declaration of a climate emergency and our participation in organizations like this, our city staff feel like they, they now have um, official permission to pick up the ball and really run with it. On the political side, I really feel that this past year has been somewhat of a paradigm shift in the, in the climate change um, um, issue. We had a federal election where climate change was one of the defining issues of that election, and you can really feel the momentum just getting stronger out there. Uh, the public, my constituents anyway, in Ward 8, are demanding real climate solutions. And even investment firms are starting to divest from fossil fuels. And just this week, we saw that the, the tech tar sands mine was put on hold. And according to the owners, in part because the province of Alberta refused to take climate change seriously. So for those of us in Hamilton and Burlington, That definitely deserves a round of applause. So for those of us in Hamilton, Burlington, I see a groundswell of momentum behind us and nothing but opportunity in front. Uh, yeah, I'm quite happy to be here to uh, continue Burlington's partnerships with the Bay Area Climate Change Council, Mohawk College, and uh, of course the city of Hamilton. Uh, Mayor Mead Ward sends her regrets tonight. She is speaking at the Fem Power event in Burlington with our other uh, women councillors. So. Yeah, I'm a bit sad to miss it, but uh, I'm also happy to be here to talk to you and welcome you to this, uh, to this climate forum. Uh, look, it, generally it's the politician's job at these events to tell you how amazing your government is doing um, on your behalf and how we've made all the difference and you can count on us to keep making that change. And uh, I'm going to do exactly that. Uh, and, then, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit of what I really think with the remaining time. And I think I only had two minutes, so uh, I'll be quick. Um, so, uh, look, the city of Burlington is committed to fighting climate change by reducing our carbon footprint and increasing our resiliency. Uh, in April 2019, Burlington City Council was one of the first Ontario cities to uh, declare a climate emergency, and uh, just one month after John Paul. But... Uh, I, I, we were all brand new. We didn't know what we were supposed to be doing the first couple months. So uh, uh, we, made, we managed April 2019, and, and we direct the staff in that uh, declaration to complete a climate action plan and apply a climate lens to decision making. Uh, the plan is set to be approved in March, and uh, embedded in that plan are our commitments to be net carbon neutral in city operations by 2040 and a path to carbon neutrality as well. Uh, our plan is focused on deep energy retrofits of existing buildings, expansion of renewable energy, and support for electric mobility and equipment. And we're also developing sustainable building guidelines and uh, putting our money where our mouth is by increasing our transit fleet to get more cars off the road because Burlington uh, had uh, more than two cars per household. That's, that's where we're at now, so we have a long way to go there. Um, and uh, oh, the climate adaptation strategy is coming up next. Now, I'll do a little uh, self-assessment. Um, and I, I know you guys are assessing as well. So what were the verbs I used? It was commit, uh, declare, plan, develop. Um, that, those verbs, they're necessary verbs, but they're not sufficient. And the same goes for uh, the city of Burlington and our actions so far. The, the actions are good. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. Um, you know, commitments and declarations are great, but they aren't a plan. And a plan is great, 
but it needs meaningful commitments. Those commitments go nowhere unless they're effectively implemented, and that effective implementation is great, but only if they deliver results and real change. So I, th I think my municipality is on the right path, I do. Uh, but the fact is that we're not very far along that path. And the next uh, step is the hardest, the most important, and most expensive part, and that is the effective implementation. That takes unwavering commitment, and it takes budget. And municipalities have to be at the forefront of that. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you right now, we'll never get those results without all three levels of government coming to the table with commitments backed up by money. Uh, in other words, as it stands now, we're not going to get there. Uh, but all is not lost. Um, actually, I think we're pretty close, like John Paul was saying. I mean, um, we're close to having that commitment uh, that's needed. Uh, the expectations of our residents uh, and our citizens to meet this challenge is, is reaching that critical mass uh, where inaction is basically politically unpalatable. So I'm hopeful. It's just a matter of time, and it's a matter of your energy and my energy, our energy and commitment um, before we have all levels of government in Canada doing just enough to meet the challenge. And of course, as you know, the question is how soon that will happen, how much damage we'll do to our environment in the meantime as we lumber through the steps required to make real change. And that's why this forum matters. Um, I think there's a clear line to be drawn between your participation tonight, our participation, your local actions, your advocacy, and the larger fight against climate change. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. This is fantastic. I can't believe uh, how many people we have here today. In fact, we were oversubscribed by almost 50 people. So next year, we need to make sure we have a bigger facility to accommodate, and hopefully a lot more to tell. My name is Richard Corusel. I'm the chair for the Bay Area Climate Change Council, and it's my uh, pleasure to be here and, and to welcome you to this forum uh, that we have put on for you. Um, I'd like to kick off by first thanking Paul uh, Armstrong and Mohawk Paul, your leadership, uh, along with Mohawk's leadership in the climate change field, has been outstanding. Uh, you're certainly one of the leading, uh, if not the leading, uh, uh, educational institution in the country in this field. So thank you for doing that, and thank you for being our host tonight. Much appreciated. I'd also like to thank uh, Councillors Danko and Nissan for their ongoing support through the municipalities. Um, a lot of the work that we need to do, we can't do without them. and. Uh, John Paul, I'm really glad you, you committed to the 160 grand because that makes a big difference for us. And so uh, we'll look forward to that being approved by council, I guess, on April the 1st. Um, so thank you for that, and thank you for being here, and for you personally being a champion um, in, in this area. Um, again, we need you to be there. And, and Councillor Nissan, thank you again. I've had a chance to, to go before uh, council in Burlington a few times. Um, and you've always been a big supporter of the work that we need to do. So thank you both for being here and bringing greetings. And finally, thank, I want to thank all of you for being here in our audience. Um, today is an important day for us, for us to be able to communicate to you uh, some of the things that we've been doing as a Bay Area Climate Change Council, but also to help you understand who we are, because in some cases I'm sure you're kind of going scratching your head, who are these people? and how we got here. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but we're also going to ask you to participate in a bit of a workshop at the end of the day. Uh, because we want to hear your thoughts and your views on some of the things that we're proposing and the direction that we want to go. So my job now is to lay out uh, for you what the balance of the evening will look like. So we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the evening in terms of uh, our, our history, where we've come from, how we got here. We're actually a relatively new and young organization. Um, we're also going to give you a chance to, as I said, to talk about the things that we're um, proposing and the areas we want to work on. We'll also uh, give you a bit of uh, progress on what we've done in 2019 and what our next steps will be for 2020. Uh, at 620, I will introduce Mark Jackard. Uh, Mark uh, is our keynote speaker who will speak about his new book, The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success, that will be followed by a Q&A. And finally, we're going to ask you to engage in the, in the workshop that I mentioned. And our hope is to have you on your way by 8.30.
Um, I should mention as well that the this event is being live streamed, um, so uh, you'll have a chance to pick it up uh, not only tonight but um, in the future as we be able to put it online for you. So let me get into a little bit of where we've come from, um, and uh, both uh, councillors have talked about sort of the basics of, of how this came together. So Hamilton and Burlington have had a history of collaboration uh, through the Bay Area uh, Restoration Council um, and that has worked very well in terms of um, making a big difference in our Bay. Uh, so. Uh, in 2017, the Chambers of Commerce in Burlington and Hamilton put on the first uh, Bay Area Economic Summit. And at that summit, both mayors committed to working towards climate change and collaboration. And in 2018, uh, Mohawk College joined the partnership uh, with the Center for Climate Management to coordinate regional efforts to mitigate climate change through emission reductions and to position the Bay Area for success in the low carbon economy and develop best shared practices. But how would they do this? How would this be done and who would do it? So in the first half of 2018, a comprehensive community engagement process and a GHG em emission inventory was undertaken with the support of, the, with, of provincial funding. This community engagement led to the design and formation of the Bay Area Climate Change Council, or BAC as we call it. On June 27, 2018, the proposed governance structure was presented and adopted However, a month later, all provincial funding for climate action was withdrawn. Created a big problem for all of us. However, undeterred, the first meeting of BAC made up of 14 community leaders was held on October 23rd and 2018, just over a year ago. So now let me introduce you to the BAC uh, members and the volunteer members and their supporting organizations. <coughs> relatively new, but starting to tell people who we are and what we do. I'm Anna Poutler. Rafik Danji. I'm Carolyn Barnes. My name is Richard Corris. Hi, I'm Bruce Newbold. Hi, I'm Karen Logan. Hello, I'm Richard Allen. Hi, I'm uh, Scott Peck. Hi, I'm Anita Cassidy. My name is Kim Barrett. My name is Michael Mikulak. My name is Linda Lukasik. Heidi Levitsky. My name is Amy Schnur. And we are your Bay Area Climate Change Council. The uh, Bay Area Climate Change Council is made up of a number of public and private sector partners. At the table we have both the City of Hamilton and the City of Burlington who are both committed to climate change. We've got a number of not-for-profit and private sector groups. It's really easy to get overwhelmed by the scale and scope of climate change. This is the defining issue of our generation. If we don't find a way to deal with this, there's a lot at stake. Absolutely, it's a crisis when we see all of these weather impact events that are supposed to be like 50, 100 year events. They're now happening every five to 10 years. That's climate change. The objective of the council is to lead the municipalities of Hamilton and Burlington towards zero carbon by 2050. You know, we need this council. We need to be thinking about these issues. We want to do it in a way that's friendly and approachable to people, where people can feel engaged and that they have a voice. So we're focusing on transportation, buildings, food systems. Each of those areas will have its own task force. It was initiated partly through the two mayors of the cities, recognizing that there was an issue. And they they were responding to community, to community calling for action. It goes back to 2017 when the Hamilton and Burlington Chamber of Commerce held the first Bay Area Economic Summit. The two mayors came together and said um, climate change is an important issue for both of us and we both need to work together, which created the Bay Area concept as opposed to it's not just Hamilton, it's not Burlington, it's the Bay Area. I think really it's the, the relationship building that's taken place at the council table that's one of the uh, the major accomplishments that we've had over the past year and a half, just getting to know each other. The fact that we're together doing something is the biggest action item. It made me realize just how big the issue is, that it's not just necessarily an environmental issue, it's a social issue. So we've been able to comment on the draft climate action plans from both the cities of Burlington and cities of Hamilton. We have this fantastic history through the Hamilton Harbour Remedial Action Plan where we've demonstrated and proven that bringing together a couple of municipalities and, and rowing in the same direction to make positive change 
can actually lead to amazing impacts on the ground. By taking cars off the road and improving our public transit system, then that's going to improve not just our air quality, but it's going to help to meet some of our climate change objectives by reducing greenhouse emissions within the city. Buildings are very important because they account usually for greenhouse gas emissions. So the focus there is both on renovating existing buildings, both commercial and residential, industrial, but also on new buildings. The foods that we eat, whether we tend towards a more plant-based diet or a more meat-based diet, how far away our food is coming from. Um, I think it's, it's really important that um, you know, we look at the community to be environmental stewards and to do, to do the right things. We are now starting to develop our uh, implementation teams. I think what success looks like is that we're able to honour our mission. We're able to not only create a sense of urgency in the Bay Area about climate and the action that we need to take, but it's to effectively act on it, measure it, get people excited about recognising that while it is daunting to take action on climate, there is no planet B. We got to move. So I'm excited about that. And it provides a sense of hope and healing for our community that we can move forward together. And it's something that I think we can pass on to our kids and our grandkids. Every little bit counts. With small consistent actions, it can lead to big change. I mean, it's going to result in, as far as I'm concerned, really enhanced quality of life in both cities. Because a decade from now, you know, the planet is going to be a very different place and we need to be ready for that. Because at the end of the day, it's something that each and every one of us must do. It, it's not just up to the Bay Area Climate Change Council, it's up to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your Bay Area Climate Change Council. And uh, I came into the role as a chair uh, rather late in the game. It's been not even quite a year yet. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the things that impressed me the most is the commitment of these people to this community. And I'm very proud to be working with all of them. So let me take you now uh, a little bit of what, and talk a little bit about what happened in 2019. Um, so we really focused a lot on setting the foundation for our work with the development of a longer term strategy. And that strategy include the vision that the Bay Area is a thriving, resilient, zero carbon community by 2050. And you'll catch some of the alignment with both municipalities. And our mission is to create a sense of urgency and mobilize the community to catalyze climate change action in the Bay Area. We also worked on the development of a five-year work plan based on, greenhouse gas, on the greenhouse gas uh, inventories that were undertaken, as well as direct feedback from the community on top on the top priority areas of focus. These priorities, pri these priorities focus on three criteria. What actions will help us significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the region? Recognizing the role of the federal and provincial governments, as well as community organizations that can collectively impact initiative uh, of local organizations, advocate for and catalyze. How do we make our cities better through climate action? We can use climate change policies, initiatives to improve services, increase public health, and the quality of life for all citizens. With that in mind, we picked four main areas of focus. Buildings, transportation, food, as well as advocating for progressive climate policies within municipalities. I would like to take a few minutes, I would take a few minutes to explain each one of these, but I, I think we're going to be a little shy, shy on time. And in the workshops, you'll have a chance to talk more about uh, buildings, transportation, as well as food and uh, some of the advocacy work that we're going to undertake. In terms of our advocacy focus, the Council has been very active in supporting the advo and advocating for the Burlington Climate Action Plan and the Hamilton Corporate Climate Plan Change Plan. Our members have been advising and, and commenting on both drafts and advocating support uh, to both of these plans to both councils. Sustainable funding has been an ongoing challenge for the Council. The Council lost its provincial funding in 20, 2018 and BAC has been supported in, in kind uh, by in-kind support from the cities and 
uh, from both cities and from Mohawk College and its members. While this help is very much appreciated, the lack of sustainable funding has severely limited the capacity of the Council to, to execute on its work plan. There is a clear need for dedicated staff and the Council struck a fundraising committee, a working group to secure long-term funding commitments from the cities and additional funding for Council supported projects. So we may have been successful here. Uh, last year, the, the Council hosted public outreach events, including the Bay Area Climate Change Summit and Youth Summit, which reached over 500 residents and youth. We began our planning for this climate change forum uh, last year and has, and as you see, has been oversubscribed, hosting more than 150 people today. And finally, the Council has been supporting engagement and outreach through member organizations throughout the year. So what's next? We are more moving forward with hiring of full-time staff in April 2020, pending approval, of course, the, of the funding from the City of Hamilton. The City, city of Burlington is already committed uh, to the funding from their portion. And hopefully April will have that put into play. Uh, we'll be hosting a series of roundtables to develop the implementation teams that will embark on ambitious projects to accelerate climate action on buildings, transportation, with food to follow later in the year. Our continued advocacy to, to see further development and execution of the Municipal Climate Action Plans at Council, will be, we will be a loud and constant voice looking for specific actions and performance targets that will drive down GHG emissions within the city corporations themselves and throughout the Bay Area. We, in, we intend to be holding them accountable. And finally, we will continue to engage in ex and educate the Bay Area community in partnership with, with BAC uh, member organizations. So in summary, it's been an exciting ride as we bring the back, as we bring back together and set our strategy and foundation. Despite the funding challenges, we see 2020 to be an exciting year to move forward with the implementation of our work plan. Thanks very much. almost back on schedule. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Jacquard. Uh, he's a professor of sustainable energy at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Grenoble. He has helped many governments with climate energy policy, including serving on the China Council for International Cooperation on the Environment and Development and Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 1990s, he chaired British Columbia's Utilities Commission and in the 2000s, he helped design its famous carbon tax, clean energy standard, and other climate energy policies. He's a member of the Royal Society of Canada in recognition of his research and a frequent media presence in Canada and the US. His book, Sustainable Fossil Fuels, won a, the Dorner Prize. His efforts on climate change range from testifying before the US Congress, the European Commission, to being arrested for blocking a coal train. Mark is here today to talk about his new book, The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success. In, his, in this book, he notes that humanity has failed for three decades to decarbonize our energy system to address the climate threat. Yet average citizens still don't know what to do personally or what to demand for their politicians. Mark offers a clear and simple strategic path for climate concerned citizens to drive climate success by acting locally while thinking globally. Good evening. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm excited to be here and excited to have just learned all about this building and, uh, and now to have learned about uh, the excellent work you're doing. Um, I'm going to get right into it. This book uh, could be uh, different than what some of you are expecting because it's a book about narrowing down what we actually need to do and therefore it may challenge some of the things that you've been pursuing and that are really dear to you and you think we all ought to be doing. And that's why I start out my talk um, explaining how someone like me who has worked in this area as a researcher, uh, how I try to explain what we think we know as experts and how that relates to how we as citizens um, and as our political leaders uh, take on a challenge like this. So the goal of my book um, is to help 
climate concerned citizens detect deliberate delusions and inadvertent myths, which may be from others, but it may be your own, uh, elect climate sincere politicians who do effective policy, and eliminate your own personal emissions with not a whole bunch of things, but just two actions. And a key theme of the book is, as I said, to focus on our human biases and therefore to inward focus critical thinking. And um, one way to just, you can say a picture says a thousand words, but also uh, some very short quotes can do that. And I'm going to read a couple of short quotes to you about this topic. One of them is by a writer from uh, almost 100 years ago, an American uh, uh, writer, Upton Sinclair, who said, it is difficult to get someone to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. And the second one is from the philosopher Bertrand Russell, also writing about 100 years ago, who said, what someone believes on grossly insufficient evidence is an index into their desires. So we all know about this, and, and, and psychologists will have terms for it. Uh, the first, maybe self-interest bias, and the second, wishful thinking bias. Um, and I'm going to be talking about how, how important it is to recognize these and the kinds of mechanisms that we ought to follow to do that. And the way I'm going to try to describe how one would do that is to explain what I do to try to get uh, the students that I have uh, to be more like scientists uh, in their critical thinking skills that they apply to themselves. And so, as I said, the inward uh, thinking critical skills. And so I've been teaching for almost 30 years, a graduate course in Vancouver, um, and the students are PhD and master's students, and it's in sustainable energy. And here's a photo. Uh, we, we do some of the classes in my dining room, uh, and so there's a, a, a happy group there. And uh, what I do is I, at the very first class, I say to them, all right, take some issue that you have a, have a position on. Um, should we do more nuclear power? Should we do no nuclear power? Should we do biofuels or no biofuels? Large hydro or not? Pick something and tell me what your view is. Tell all of us and give the best argument for why you have that view. And so they do that, and they're, they're clever students. They're PhD and master's students. They do a very good job. And then, you know, you may recall in junior high school or somewhere you were asked to debate uh, the debating club, hone your skills. But rarely do we ask people to debate themselves, but that's what they ought to be doing. So then I say, okay, you argued strongly uh, in, against biofuels. Now give us the very best arguments for why, in some places on the planet, we should develop biofuels. And so they do it. And they're terrible. And so I say, do it again. And they're still terrible. Now, some of them eventually start to get better at this. But you realize they really haven't given any time to the counter arguments. They haven't thought about it. And so that's what we try to get them to do in the debate yourself game. And sometimes it means that, no, I'll still stay with the position I have, the working hypothesis that I live under. Others, I'm not going to have such a strong position anymore. It depends on the context. I'm not sure. And others, you may change your mind or be ready to, which is, the, and the quote I'll have for that is the famous economist John Maynard Keynes, who said, when the evidence I see changes, I change my mind. What do you do? So when we start to take that kind of approach, and so the book that I'm referring to talks a lot about that, um, then when you apply it to the climate change threat, uh, it, can, it can lead to us thinking about um, some, some specific challenges that we don't think about as much. So of course we know that the major challenge is we have to stop burning coal, oil, and natural gas, right? decarbonize. That's the crux of the problem. But if we look at that um, problem and look more critically at the evidence, there's three key challenges that will come out. And some of this will be troubling to you. And I'll, I'll talk about the evidence. It's the evidence from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, leading scholars in the world. 
The first is the myth that fossil fuels are expensive, meaning that the alternatives to fossil fuels are cheap. But in fact, fossil fuels are plentiful, high quality, and low cost. And their price falls with ongoing innovation. And as we try to switch away from fossil fuels, we'll lower the demand and the price will fall. And we've even been experiencing that. Um, and therefore, they still offer the cheapest development path for the poorest people on this planet, the poorest four, five billion people on this planet. And so people in those countries are looking to follow the path of China. And China is an example here. Here's the greenhouse gas emissions of China in the yellow line in that period of rapid economic development that they had, growing their economy, growing almost 10% a year. And you see in that period of time, they surpassed the United States, Europe. And now India and other countries are, on the, are starting to follow that path. And they're doing it not because of some nasty corporations are forcing them to do it. It's the cheapest way to expand their electricity systems. It's the cheapest way to expand their transportation systems. And some evidence of this is you'll also hear people saying, well, finally, renewables are beating fossil fuels. I mean, has anybody ever heard that? I hear it all the time. So I know you must be hearing that. Maybe you say it. All right, well, let's look at some evidence. So if we look at global energy use, this table goes is annual increases in energy production uh, in each year. And the black column represents the, addition, the growth in fossil fuel production in each year. And the green um, column represents the growth in renewables. So fossil fuels are growing uh, in quantity much faster than renewables. And then some people have said, oh yes, but now renewables are doing a little better. And then we've signed the Paris Agreement. Well, the last few years show you even what happened since the Paris Agreement. And the latest data shows that that's continuing as well. So if we look at um, this growth in fossil fuels, we see the growth in greenhouse gas emissions and a forecast would show that. Now on this figure, this is again CO2 emissions um, from energy use. The developed countries, the wealthier countries, the developing countries include China, and I've got it historically, but now the forecast, there's very little, like China doesn't really grow in that forecast. It's the rest of the developing world that's growing. So that's that first myth, that fossil fuels are cheap. So, you know, we've got, it's good that fossil fuels are expensive, and that that's the myth. The second myth is the myth of a voluntary global agreement. So decarbonization is a global problem. So we, we talk about, oh, here's what we're doing, so we're solving it. We need to figure out strategically how to be part of a of solving something that's a global problem. And that's very difficult. And one reason it's difficult is because we don't have strong or effective global governance institutions and our diplomatic processes are very ineffective on this. And if you look at human diplomacy, it's been very ineffective over the years. There are some successes, of course, but over the decades and centuries, I should say. And therefore, in a global problem, it's hard for individual countries to lead because each is only a fraction of the problem and therefore only a fraction of the solution. And so what happens? Well, for 25 years, once a year, the rich countries and the, all the countries in the world meet together. Uh, they did it in Madrid last December. Uh, next uh, December, it's in Scotland. And they get together and they say, okay, let's make an agreement here. Now we know it has to be a binding agreement um, and they say, but we can get to that agreement voluntarily. We're all gonna agree on what's a fair allocation. And so the poor countries say, well, you gotta help us out. Otherwise we'll use the cheap fossil fuels. And the rich countries say, yes, we agree. So we'll give you some money. And then they come together with these and they're miles apart. And they have been for 25 years. And independent academic experts have written for almost 25 years, why this will never result in a binding agreement that will significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And yet we still 
keep meeting and doing this. The third myth is the myth of a rational domestic policy-making process. Now, I don't need to talk a lot about this in Ontario right now, I think. Um, but the task for climate-sincere politicians is difficult because fossil fuels are incumbent, so financial self-interest, that bias I talked about, mo motivates corporations and individuals to trumpet the benefits from continued use of fossil fuels. And also, even when, and then there's climate insincere politicians who can fake it because we're trying to do a transition over several decades so they can say, or even they can say a decade and a half into the future, here's where I'll be. Oh, but I don't need to do much right now to get, I promise you, I will. And that can work with a certain percentage of uh, voters and especially the ones who are not as climate concerned as the people here. You, um, and the other thing is that climate insincere politicians can lie about the economic harm from effective policies, exploiting for, in the case of the carbon tax or carbon pricing, like the cap and trade that Ontario had, the anti-tax biases that a, some percentage of voters, doesn't have to be big, just has to be in swing ridings and just enough people who single issue vote, and that can be important. And so that can be happening whether we're talking Ontario or whether we're talking in France. So with these three challenges, right, the, the, the fantasticness of fossil fuels, uh, the global nature of the problem, and then the fact that our own political processes, um, I think sometimes at municipal government levels, the processes are better. It's a sort of something more immediate than at our more senior levels of government that we're challenged. And when people see all of that, and even some of the comments that I just heard even in your video, um, there's a tendency to see this as a huge, multiple, multivariate, complicated problem. And so I just went and, uh, and preparing these, my talks for this book, I went and got a quote. I knew I could find one right away. And I'll read this one to you from uh, a writer in ProPublica. Fossil fuels are so integrated into our lives that phasing them out would require us to change everything about how and where we live how we get around, and how we make money. So doesn't that sound right? I mean, it's so complicated. It's uh, so challenging. There's so many aspects to it. Um, well, I'm going to argue that it's really simple. And I'm going to, in the next few slides, show you what I mean by that simple path, which, of course, I elaborate on uh, in the book. The first is that we have to focus on key actions in key sectors. What are those key actions? Phasing out the burning of coal and oil and in most uses of natural gas. And so you might have jurisdictions that are now moving to coal phase outs or China, Norway, others moving to gasoline phase out. So those are the key actions. What are the key sectors? It's electricity and transportation. Now, why is that? I'll talk about buildings later. It's buildings too. But first of all, for electricity and for transportation, we have all the technologies that we need and we know what their cost is. So I can calculate for you as an energy economist what it means for um, the standard of living, the budget of, of, uh, of a typical household uh, as we make that transition. And it's actually a very small impact over a couple of uh, decades as we transition. Also, really important, remember the global nature of the problem. We can actually act unilaterally in these two sectors because they're domestic sectors. Um, we're not part of trading internationally when it comes to electricity and very little when it comes to our transportation system itself that we run internally in our country, in our economy. Um, whereas the major globally competitive sectors of industry, steel, cement, aluminum, chemicals. Those are what we call trade exposed. Uh, we try to act in those areas, but we're much more restrained. And I want to show you that um, if you think about where we need to get to and you remember the developing world, uh, it turns out that electricity and transportation are very dominant. 
Um, so on this figure, what am I showing you? The size, so this is, if humanity keeps going along like this with, yes, some policies, but not sort of doing what we've been doing over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years and keeps going to 2050, then our emissions continue to go up. The global emissions would be the annual emissions, about 45 gigatons of CO2 per year. And the pies, the size of the pies, so this is the annual emissions in 2050, it's much bigger for non-OECD countries, those are the developing countries, than it is for the OECD countries, that means Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And you look and see that transportation and electricity are more than half of the emissions. Yellow is, is the liquids in transportation and red in electricity. So that's a standard conventional forecast. Imagine, we know we can flip these sectors. We know that countries can do this without waiting for a global agreement, and thank goodness. Um, and then we know what a huge impact it is. So it slows down the rate of, of, uh, of, of climate change while we're also working in the other areas and trying to get an international agreement. So that was actions and sectors. And then what else do we have to do? Well, you talked a bit about policies. We have to have what are called compulsory policies. So those decarbon, because fossil fuels are so cheap and they're the best option, the decarbonization actions don't happen without compulsory policies. And I've got a little diagram here that simplifies for us. Uh, the compulsory policies are either regulations, and there's different kinds, or carbon pricing, and there's two different kinds. There's the carbon tax we have in British Columbia, or there's the cap and trade that Ontario had briefly and that Quebec still has with California. The non-compulsory policies, like giving people a subsidy to insulate their home, they can be important. They can accompany the compulsory policies, but they are not a substitute for the compulsory policies. And that's the important part of this. Um, yeah, and I will leave it at that. Uh, so what are some basics about compulsory policies? We have to have carbon pricing and or regulations to drive decarbonization. But do you notice I said and or? So what does that mean logically? It, it means that carbon pricing is not essential. You can do this entirely with, um, with regulations. Or regulations are not essential, and you could do it entirely with carbon pricing. And this is true. Experts all agree on this. And yet you'll hear people telling you we have to price carbon emissions. It's not true. We may want to do that, but that's a choice, not an obligation to get to complete decarbonization. And in the regulatory side, there are flexible regulations that can be sometimes politically easier than carbon pricing, and yet almost as what we say economically efficient. That means it's low cost for the economy to get those emission reductions. And I give talks to policy people, and I will be again in Ottawa in two days, where I focus on how you make regulations more flexible so that it doesn't pick technology winners and allows some competitive processes that therefore help us to lower cost, but yet these are regulations, not carbon pricing. And in leading jurisdictions, these kind of approaches take a major role. And I'll just give you one example, but I could have given you many, all the way through from Scandinavia, different jurisdictions in Canada, but I'll give California, because they're one of the leaders in North America, or if not the leader in this pie chart, uh, shows you the reductions that California's current set of policies have been achieving and will achieve by 2050. So that would be the reduction in annual emissions is, the, is depicted by the size of the pie chart. And the red shows you carbon pricing. And the rest, the yellow, are different kinds of flexible regulations. A renewable portfolio standard that requires a growing share of renewables in electricity generation. A low carbon fuel standard, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, a low carbon fuel standard that requires us to move down the intensity of, en of carbon in the energy we use in transportation. Or a vehicle emission standard, which would be like 
well, now Quebec doing a zero emission vehicle standard, British Columbia, and California. So most of the reductions <clears throat> caused by regulations. Now, okay, so that's pretty simple. Two sectors, um, very simple fuel switching actions. So it looks like it's simple. <laughs> For three decades, experts have known a coordinated global effort won't happen voluntarily. Electricity and transportation are uh, achievable uh, and are globally critical. And that renewables won't be fossil fuels without carbon price or regulations. So if experts know this, what's, what's holding back? Global decarbonization. And I'm going to now run through some of these things. And obviously, some of them, as I said, are going to be troubling to some of you. Uh, in the book, uh, if you see, see me kind of cavalierly dismissing something that is important to you here, I don't do that in the book. And I've been really happy with the reviews of the books by pe of the book by people who nonetheless hold dear to some of the things that I'm challenging you with here tonight. The first is sort of the easiest. It's the deliberate delusions that are kind of familiar to us. It's fossil fuel interests or people who associate their interests with the continuation in the use of fossil fuels will promote myths to stall action. The climate science is uncertain. This next fossil fuel project is essential. And we live this, these, these kind of things in Canada every day. Um, we have to wait for major innovation to decarbonize, which is completely untrue. Um, and there's no point in acting until we have a global agreement. But I just showed you how you can act. You can work on the domestic sectors. And if you flip them, you've actually gotten halfway where you needed to go without a global agreement. The second one, though, and that relates to that exercise I was talking about at the beginning about debating yourself. And that's when we tend to stick to some very rigid pro and con views. And a lot of cons climate concerned people can be like that on our looking at our decarbonization actions and policies. They'll say we mustn't have nuclear or I've seen we must have nuclear. Um, we mustn't or we must use large hydropower. We mustn't use biofuels. I hear that all the time. We're already using biofuels all over the place in Brazil, and you could be doing it in other uh, semi-tropical countries. Um, biofuels are 50%. Imagine, that's a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Translate that through the developing world. In Finland today, biofuels are 20% of, of replaced liquid gasoline and diesel. We mustn't use carbon capture and storage, you know, take, still using fossil fuels, but capturing the CO2 emissions and burying them. And as I already said, we mustn't or must not use carbon taxes. I can tell you the fossil fuel industry loves this rigidity. It plays right into their hands. So what I'm asking you to think about is to start debating yourself, challenging yourself, and, and be careful not to let perfection be the enemy of good. And I'm going to give you one example for that. Uh, it's a book I wrote 15 years ago. Um, and why did I write it? So already then, since I advised governments and I've been very involved in the media and public perceptions for, as I say, 30 years now, I was alarmed how uh, people were arguing environmentalists were arguing, we just got to stop using fossil fuels. In other words, telling people in fossil fuel rich regions, your economy needs to be annihilated in order to save the planet, even if that might not have been true. So you can guess what they would do with that. The Upton Sinclair quote gives it away with like all of us, we are subject to bias and that bias will be no, 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 the client science is uncertain. We need to do this uh, project. It's dependent, our economy is dependent on it. And so that's why I wrote a book called Sustainable Fossil Fuels. And, um, and that's not me on the bicycle there, but uh, uh, it was a very popular cover. And what I was doing with that is I was, I was writing and saying, if you're in a fossil fuel endowed region, you could still be part of the climate solution future. So let's work on that and see how we could do it. And I wrote it deliberately for that reason. And I was amazed at how unpopular within, maybe I wasn't amazed, I was disappointed 
with how unpopular that book was with environmentalists. They said, how can you possibly be willing to compromise with people who are involved in the fossil fuel industry? And I said, I'm willing to do that because I want us to be strategic and I know most likely we'll fail. So if we're most likely gonna fail, I better be willing to challenge myself and look for compromises and look for opportunities on that path. The third is what I'll call wishful thinking biases. I won't spend too much time on that, but many climate concerned people have biases about that, that actually can hinder the implementation of, effect, of those effective compulsory policies we need. And I go through, uh, there's actually a chapter in each book for this, where I'm not against energy efficiency, but energy efficiency rarely makes money. In other words, the extra capital cost, the extra money I invested in insulation or a more efficient device does not pay itself off through lower bills. And I've, I've actually seen buildings like this before too. And when I've done a calculation for them, well, first of all, I've asked people, and what was your estimate for the future natural gas price? Because you had to have one to forecast if this was beneficial to spend the extra money. And often, their forecast of the natural gas price is of a price that's going up. It's not going up, it's going down. So we wanna build buildings like this, but let's make sure, and we want everyone to build buildings like this. So let's make sure it's, econo it's economical to build buildings like this, which is why you need emissions pricing or regulations. Another one I've already talked about that renewables are out competing fossil fuels, not true. Um, that removing fossil fuel subsidies is a game changer. Now, for some of you, again, you may have devoted a lot of your time to this issue and also to the divestment campaigns. And I'm not, you know, you know disparaging them and denying them their importance, but actually I'm asking strategically, if that's where we're devoting our time, what are we not devoting our time on? Which again is those compulsory policies in two key sectors that I've just been talking about. So again, the fossil fuel industry, yeah, ask yourself, if what I'm working on, would they be happy with me doing that or not? So they would, if we want to get cars not using gasoline and diesel anymore, they're not happy with that. If I'm running a divestment campaign or removing fossil fuel subsidies instead, that's good news. What else is holding back decarbonization? Agending, agenda hitching biases. We've been stymied on this problem for so long that everybody wants to hook something else onto there. And I mean, that, I, can, I can understand the motive for that, but it ends up leaving us in this world, which gets back to that Lisa Song quote I did earlier, where it sounds like we meet dramatic behavioral, social, economic revolution in just two decades, I mean, whether it's how we, how we eat, or how we, if we get around uh, in long distance travel with planes or not. Um, I, I did see in your, so when I saw your video there, it was how can we use, uh, have less car use? I'm sorry, but of course the municipal government should be working on that. And of course we should be working on that. But the primary one, there'll still be all these cars out there and there'll be cars all over the planet. They all have to be zero emission. And in the wealthy countries, they have to be zero emission in the next two decades. And then we might have a chance that in the next three or four decades, they'd be zero emission in the developing world. So even if we're slower than a decade on this with cars, um, and then once you do have all the cars zero emission, then it's great to do tran transit because, uh, or uh, you know, non non car mobility because of other wonderful things for the livability of a city, for our health, and so on. And we'll just keep doing that. But we will have vehicles, personal mobility devices, and these can range all the way through to um, we need to achieve complete global equity of various kinds, or even we must abolish capitalism. And Naomi Klein wrote a book about that. So I have a chapter that kind of deconstructs her position. And as I say, these goals can be laudable in themselves, but when they're hitched to climate success, they make the challenge seem far more complex than it is. And so, of course, the fossil fuel industry loves agenda hitching. And then the fifth um, of the points that are holding back de uh, decarbonization is that we need to be able to identify climate insincere politicians. <laughs> now, of course, 
I mean, it helps if they pose together for a photo. <laughs> but what if they're a little more clever than that? <clears throat> what if we actually have to make sure we have some means of identifying them? And that's part of the task of the climate-concerned citizen. Climate insincere politicians deliberately confuse actions and policies. So in the last federal election, Andrew Scheer said, we don't need carbon pricing uh, or regulations. We're going to do innovation. So do you get that now? Like, but it's the, it's the carbon pricing or regulation that causes the innovation. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. But that's a... And so, um, and I'll just say, you guys had a green slide up there. If you take a look at it, you mixed actions and policies, and it's just a fun challenge. And I would, I would have fun, or I would love to talk to you about that and suggest a different way of presenting that. Um, they implement only non-compulsory policies. Remember the one on the, on the other side? Uh, the, the, uh, they exaggerate the cost of compulsory policies. You already know that. And so, of course, fossil fuel industry not only loves it rewards uh, these politicians. So the task of the climate-concerned citizen is to find and support those climate-sincere politicians, which is the opposite of this. You know of what I just talked about. You know they will implement compulsory policies, especially in electricity and transportation, but also in buildings, as we've been talking about here, and light industry and agriculture and so on. So I'm not belittling the other things you had on your list. I've just already explained to you why this is so important from a global point of view. Um, they'll also implement, when it comes to the trade exposed industries, we've actually, well, anyway, I'll talk about this, but um, you've got to be careful not to raise their cost of production, but there are ways to drive innovation in those industries. That's where innovation is needed um, if we can't get a global agreement. Um, and in fact, what a climate sincere politician should be doing is trying to initiate multi-country uh, uh, agreements at coal phase out or gasoline vehicle phase out. And they would also be ready to enact carbon tariffs. And in fact, should be moving in that direction. And that means, I'm sorry, we know you're a poor country in Bangladesh, but if, you're, if you were, or India, if you were burning coal to make clothing to sell here, there's going to be a tariff, a, a carbon tariff on that clothing. Now, that might sound really inequitable. I'm just going to argue, and as I do in the book, it's the only way that we're going to get there, given the reality of the world within which we live. So, do we have a climate sincere politician? What do you think? He, uh, you know, he approved an oil pipeline. And then when that didn't work, he bought the oil pipeline and, and then approved it again. Uh, so... I don't know. Let's take a look at, uh, at what's happened since 2015. What's been the main policy approach federally? And so I write on this for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I did an op-ed on this, well, it's last April now, um, after our meetings in, uh, in Edinburgh of the climate authors, because I went around to everyone and said, okay, here's what we're doing. Well, what's the main approach? It's a reliance on pricing and regulations with rising stringency um, and it's a leveraging of our domestic efforts into a global effort. And I'm just going to have just a few specific policies to give you that sense. So Canada now has legislation, re regulation in place to phase out our coal plants. In other words, the country as a whole is following what Ontario did uh, and doing it in about the same time frame. So 10 years from now, there won't be a coal plant operating in Canada if that government can sustain that policy. It's also launched a Powering Past Coal Initiative, recognizing that you can do this in Canada, but we've got to get other countries to sign on to this. It's got an economy-wide carbon price that's rising over time. It's got um, a carbon pricing system for the trade-exposed industries as well. We're developing regulations in, uh, for, methane, in, for in, uh, methane regulations in oil and gas. And we're developing a clean fuel standard again, that affects coal, oil, and gas. So now I ask you, you know, is the Canadian federal government climate sincere or insincere? You're gonna to have to decide that. So in summary, the simple path to climate success. Concerned citizens must simplify 
So we work to elect and support climate sincere politicians. We push them to make alliances for global coal gas phase out and carbon tariffs. Uh, and that enables us to take key personal zero emission actions, whether it's getting an electric car um, or uh, changing to using electricity in geothermal and heat pumps uh, and heat exchangers just in the way that uh, uh, people have done with this building. But, so if we don't have climate sincere politicians though, and they're not leaving that option over to us, what do you do? And this is why you notice I'm talking about climate concerned citizens, which is you. you. You might think, I've just got to talk everybody else into this. They've got to accept the science and so on. That's really difficult because of what you know about human bias. Fortunately, you don't have to do that. When we've succeeded with other environmental threats, it's been a few key people, the climate concerned people or the acid rain concerned people or the vehicle, the, the urban air pollution concerned people or the water concerned people who made the difference. Um, and it won't be any different with climate change. We fortunately don't have to talk everyone into this. Now, some of my grad students, their undergrad degrees are in engineering and so on, and we talked about how can climate um, concerned citizens uh, figure out how to act in this world then? Because it really depends. And so one of them said, well, you know, engineers build a flow chart, sort of a strategic decision making flow chart. And so we did one. Um, and so you're the climate concerned citizen. And at the start, you need to ask, is this a is this politician seem sincere? And you can't really be sure, but if, they re if you can really tell they're not sincere, well, that's going to take you down to the bottom part of the flow chart. But let's say they do seem sincere. Then the next question you have to ask yourself is, well, do they have greenhouse gas targets? And if they don't, well, that's an easy check off the list. But if they, even if they do, then you've got to say, okay, but are those greenhouse gas targets actually linked to policies? Okay, so if they're not, and if they are, though, um, are the key policies pricing and regulations? All right, so that's how you can start to do this kind of decision making. And if they are, then uh, are those pricing and regs increasing in stringency? Remember our carbon price is going up and our regulations are getting tight, the coal plant phase out. And, and if that's the case then, um, then you actually should be campaigning hard funding, working for those politicians, and in our voting system, trying to figure out working hard to get them reelected. If you're down on that other path, though, you have to kind of decide, what am I doing as a person? So I've written citizen activism here, and what does that mean? Well, we know it means being active in the way that you are as a group, and how can you focus that action? I don't have all the answers to that. I do, I'll talk about it in a minute, or I'll conclude by talking about it in a personal sense. But if you do that, and uh, then you have to ask, is it working? And if you decide it's not, or, or perhaps it's not, uh, or perhaps it is, then you might go back up to focus on, uh, on and, and head back into the same loop. Um, and, but if it doesn't seem to be working, then you're gonna have to keep doing it. So that's a kudos to my engineering students to help me with that. So my last two slides. Again, I'm in that dilemma point where your climate, where your po political leaders are climate insincere. And, uh, and so what, what does that mean for us morally as individuals here? We talk about right, you know, everybody declaring it's an emergency. So what does that mean to say it's an emergency? What does it mean for you? Does it mean you're off the hook now because you signed something that said it's an emergency? What does it mean for you personally? Um, Bill McKibben, who writes a lot on climate, uh, says, planet Earth is miles outside its comfort zone. How many of us will go beyond ours? Now, I've worked in this field for 30 years, and I've been, yes, I've been a recognized expert in this field, and it's meant that actually my comfort zone involves advising politicians, and it's a pretty nice life. I mean, I get frustrated all the time, but at least I'm listened to. And here's just one example, this is me, uh, in 2013, testifying before the U.S. Congress Committee in Washington, D.C. Uh, against the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, and, I mean, it's not completely comfortable. The, 
the Alberta Premier uh, said that I was a traitor to Canada. And, um, and when the Globe and Mail reporter asked me about that, I said, well, she's a traitor to the planet. Um, and <laughs> so I'm not above sort of schoolyard uh, kind of taunting. Um, but what happens when we have a climate insincere government? And in the period of, and, and, and you know, you can be right of center, left of center, you may be a member of the federal conservative party. I have lots of friends who are, I have lots of them who are climate concerned. Uh, and so I, this isn't an attack on conservatives, but Stephen, the Stephen Harper government to me was clearly a climate insincere government. And that was a long period. And that may, and, and with the lack of any kind of drive and awareness in Canada that we're fortunately seeing more of now, it was when people like me had to really ask themselves, what is my moral obligation? Um, and that is why, uh, again, it was you know, former students of mine who were activists uh, who said, we need to be part of groups across the country who are standing up and risking our homes uh, in order to, uh, to, to make a statement for other Canadians. And so that's why I did it. I, I've never been arrested when I was uh, 20, in my 30s, or in my 40s, but here I am in my 50s in handcuffs uh, about to be put into the paddy wagon. Um, and that event got a lot of media in British Columbia. And we noticed that in the election of 2015, Stephen, the polls of millennials especially set a really high suspicion that Stephen Harper was climate insincere. Did we contribute to that? I have no idea. And perhaps not, it's always complicated, but it's something that I really did a lot of soul searching and I read a lot of Vaclav Havel and other people about what ought I to be doing and I am ready to do it again if need be. And one person asked me, why am I smiling then with the policeman? Well, just as he was putting me in the paddy wagon, he said, we have to stop using coal. So that was it. <laughs> <laughs> now, so what influence can citizen activism have? You know, you're just one person sitting there uh, in front of the Swedish parliament. How can you really have much effect as a citizen? But you never know. And as Margaret Mead said, I never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever had, has. But we have to be focused and strategic and even contingent decision makers. So I end with a quote from Albert Einstein, those who have the privilege to act, have the duty to know, have the duty to act. And now you know. Thank you very much. <laughs>